Republic was established in 509 BCE after the overthrow of the last Roman king called Tarquin the Proud. By the way, I will use the abbreviation BCE a lot. It means before common era. The new form of government was a result of the Romans' deep mistrust of single-person rule and their desire for a more balanced and representative government. The Roman Republic was characterized by a complex constitution that was based on a system of checks and balances. The framework of the Roman Republic consisted of two elected consuls who held equal powers, an assembly of the people called the Comitia Tributa, and a senate consisting of 300 patricians. The two consuls strove to maintain a balance of power by sharing the duties of governing. They had the power to draw up and administer laws, command the army and preside over the Comitia Centuriata, which was another important assembly. When one of the consuls made a decision, the other consul had the power to veto it. This system ensured that no one person could have too much say. Well, at least it should ensure that. The Comitia Tributa was an assembly of the people and their primary responsibilities included the election of magistrates and passing of laws. Members of the assembly were classified into one of 35 tribes based on their place of origin. The assembly could veto decisions made by the consuls or the senate thus ensuring that the people had a voice in the decision-making process. The Senate was responsible for advising the consuls and the Assembly. And they were also responsible for passing laws related to the management of finances, the Roman army and foreign relations. The senators were chosen based on their wealth and social standing. Membership in the Senate was for life. One condition to become senator was to have successfully run for office at least once. There were a number of other political offices and assemblies, including the plebeian council and the praetors, which were established to safeguard the interests of the ordinary people. The plebeian council, for instance, could veto decisions made by the senate or the comitia tributa. This highlights the magistrates were an important part of the constitution of the Roman Republic and played a vital role in the governance of the state. Since there were several different types of magistrates, each with their own specific responsibilities, we need to know them in detail. Consuls, as mentioned earlier, the office of the consul was the highest elected office in the Roman Republic. Consuls were elected for a one-year term and there were always two consuls in office at the same time. They had the power to draw up and enforce laws, command the army and serve as judges. Agent has it that the first two consuls were elected in 509 BCE, but maybe it was just, in quotation marks, a Praetor Maximus. This leads us to the Praetors. The Praetors were responsible for administering justice in Rome. They had the power to preside over courts, try cases and enforce judgments. There were initially two praetors in office, but this number was later increased to eight. Idiots. The idiots were in charge of public works, including the maintenance of public buildings, streets and sewers. They were also responsible for organizing public games and festivals and ensuring that food and other essential goods were available to the people of Rome. There were two types of idiots, the plebeian idiots and the curule idiots. Questors. The Questors were responsible for managing the finances of the Roman Republic. They oversaw the collection of taxes and other sources of revenue, and they were responsible for dispersing money to the other government officials. There were initially two Questors, but this number was later increased to 20. Censors. The censors were responsible for conducting a census. Go figure of the Roman population and assessing the wealth of individuals. They were also responsible for maintaining public morality and ensuring that government officials were of good character, whatever that in detail might have meant. 
The office of the censor was initially held by two people, but this number was later increased to five. Tribunes. The tribunes were responsible for representing the interests of the common people or the plebeians. They had the power to veto laws and decisions made by the other magistrates and could also propose their own laws. They were initially elected for a one-year term, but this was later increased to two years. The new magistrates started their offices in the time which is relevant for us on January 1st. But there was one exception. Some of the tribunes already started on December 10th. Before that, the start date for most of the offices was March 15th, a date we will nevertheless meet again. These offices weren't free for all. Well, in theory they were since the 4th century, but there were special rules in place how to get one of those. These rules were called causus honorum. This means the causus honorum was the sequence of public offices held by aspiring Roman politicians, which was considered the traditional and normative path to political power and influence in the Republic. All that was defined by the law in the Lex Vilia Annales dating back to 180 BCE. Young Roman men who wanted to enter politics typically began their political career as a military officer or by serving as an assistant to a higher ranking magistrate. They had to serve at least 10 years before they could progress. They would then advance to the lower administrative positions like the Questor or Aedile, which were typically the first offices in the Cursus Honorum ladder. With each office they held, they gained more experience, prestige and a wider political network, which they could leverage for a higher office. The speed at which someone could climb the ladder of offices varied depending on their personal connections, social status and political savvy, wealth, family connections and influential patrons often accelerated a politician's ascent up the ladder, allowing them to skip ahead to more prestigious offices. However, for those without such advantages, advancing through the offices could take many years, if not decades. There were no specific Roman laws that dictated how fast individuals could advance through the Cursus Honorum ladder, the process of ascending the political ladder was largely dependent on a combination of factors, including individual merit, wealth, family connections, and political networking. However, there were some general rules, which were almost law-like, that governed the advancement of politicians in the ladder of offices. For example, there were minimum age requirements for holding certain offices, such as the consulship which required candidates to be at least 43 years old. Additionally, many offices had a minimum number of years of experience that politicians must serve before being eligible for higher positions in the Cursus Honorum. For instance, a candidate must have served as a praetor before being eligible to run for the consulship who ran for an office but failed, had to wait for two years before he was allowed to reapply. Most people who gained an office were from Roman families that traditionally ruled, but that was not always the case. Homo novus, meaning new man in Latin, was a title given to individuals who had no prior family political experience but still managed to achieve prominence in public office. This means it was a term used to describe those who lacked the benefit of political family connections or a noble ancestry and were able to advance through the ranks of the Cursus Honorum based on their own merits. They had to work hard to build a reputation and form connections with other prominent politicians. However, there were advantages to being a homo novus. They were able to establish themselves as independent politicians who could appeal to the broader Roman population, even if they didn't come from a prestigious family. Furthermore, their outsider status often allowed them to have greater flexibility in their political campaigns, which served to distinguish them from more established politicians. Cicero is probably the most famous example for a homo novus. 
Before we can start with the real history, there is one more thing you need to know about the Republic and its constitution. The already mentioned terms Optimates and Popularis refer to two opposing political factions that emerged during the late Roman Republic. These factions were characterized by their differing ideologies, policies and support bases. The Optimates, meaning the best or the aristocrats, represented a conservative senatorial elite who favored maintaining the traditional power structure of the Republic. Membership in the Optimates was typically drawn from the patrician aristocratic class and wealthy plebeian families who held significant influence in the Senate. The Optimates advocated for preserving the authority of the Senate, upholding the privileges of the ruling class and maintaining the status quo in Roman society. They often opposed populist measures and reforms that threatened their interest, such as land redistribution, grain distributions to the urban poor and expansion of citizenship rights. The populares, meaning the people or the popular party, represented the interests of the common people, particularly the urban plebeians and lower class citizens. The popularis sought to challenge the dominance of the senatorial elite and promote policies that benefited the broader population, such as land reforms, grain subsidies and expanded citizenship rights. Leaders of the popularis often appealed to popular sentiment and employed populist rhetoric to rally support among the urban masses. They championed the rights of the plebeians against the entrenched interests of patrician aristocracy and advocated for measures to address social inequality and economic hardship. The office of the plebeian tribune was of most importance of them, but almost all politicians of the popularis were members of the nobility themselves. Overall, the conflict between the Optimates and Popularis reflected the broader tensions within Roman society between the privileged elite and the disenfranchised masses and the fights within the elites. This political polarization contributed to the instability and eventual downfall of the Roman Republic as rival factions fought for power and influence often resorting to violence and manipulation to achieve their objectives. The creation reforms are a great example for this. They are commonly seen as the first chapter of the downfall of the Roman Republic. The Gracian reforms were a series of political and economical changes implemented by the brothers Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus in the late 2nd century BCE in the Roman Republic. Originally, historians thought the reforms were aimed at addressing social and economic inequality in Rome, which had become increasingly severe due to the concentration of wealth in the hand of the wealthy elite. Nowadays, we see the reforms more as a dispute within the elites. One faction of the elites wanted to weaken the other. But let's start. Tiberius Gracchus was elected as tribune of the plebs in 133 BCE and after observing the plight of the poor farmers who were forced to work on large estates owned by wealthy landowners, he proposed a land reform bill that sought to limit the amount of land one could own. This proposal, known as the Lex Symbonia Agraria, faced stiff opposition from the wealthy patricians who saw it as a threat to their power and influence. Tiberius' colleague Mark Antony used his veto to block the proposal. As a reaction, Gracchus crossed the line. He used the Comitia Tributa to have Mark Antony removed from office. So, despite this opposition, the bill was eventually passed, which resulted in the seizure of public land held by the wealthy patricians and its redistribution to the landless masses. This move was popular with the lower classes, but did not endear Tiberius to the Optimates, who became increasingly hostile towards him. Tiberius sought re-election to continue his reforms, but he was met with fierce opposition from the patricians, who opposed any further measures 
that would dilute the wealth. This opposition resulted in violence and Tiberius was ultimately killed in a political feud. He was murdered on the Martian field. Not one of his killers had to stand trial as Appian and Plutarch as the central sources for this chapter of Roman history report. Gaius Gracchus, the younger brother of Tiberius, followed in his brother's footsteps and was elected as tribune of the plebs in 123 BCE. He sought to not only confirm but expand the reforms initiated by his brother and proposed a series of measures aimed at improving the lives of the Roman poor. This way he wanted to heal the honor of his family. He proposed bills that would introduce price controls on grain, establish public work programs and extend Roman citizenship to people living in the provinces. Knights should become judges. The province Asia should be subject to regular taxation. These proposals faced opposition from the Optimates once more who saw them as a threat to their power base. Gaius reforms ultimately failed and he too was killed in a violent political feud. He and his followers occupied the Aventine, a hill in Rome, by force. This led to the Senate declaring the so-called SEU or Senatus Consultum Ultimum which basically meant martial law, Rome became a battleground. The Senate finally prevailed by weakening the Gratian power base. They used Gaius colleague Livius Drusus to promise 36,000 people without land that they would get just that. Their land was supposed to be in Italy. That was completely impossible. Gaius had promised around 6,000 people land in northern Africa. Rumor has it that 3,000 of Gaius' followers were executed. Nevertheless, the Gratian reforms had a significant impact on the Roman Republic as they sparked a period of political instability and violence that lasted for several decades. This instability allowed for ambitious politicians like Julius Caesar to seize power, but it wasn't him who was the first one to bring the Republic close to collapse but his uncle by marriage, Gaius Marius. wasn't meant to last. On the contrary, the conflict between Gaius Marius and Lucius Cornelius Sulla was one of the key factors that contributed to the fall of the Republic. The conflict was a manifestation of major political and social upheavals 
that had griped the Republic for several decades, leading to increased political polarization, social unrest and institutional decay. In 88 BCE, Rome was facing a major threat from King Mithridates the Thix of Pontus, who was poised to invade the Republic. The Senate appointed Sulla to lead a military expedition to Asia Minor instead of Marius, who was known to be close to the plebeians. This decision led Marius to take side against the Senate and to launch a political power struggle with Sulla. Sulla, after conquering Asia and defeating Mithridates, returned to Rome to consolidate his power base in the government. Marius, with his again newfound popularity among the populace, tried to undermine Sulla's position in the government by introducing a series of reforms that sought to limit the power of the Senate and increase the power of elected officials. Sulla, with the backing of the Senate, responded with force and declared Marius to be an enemy of the state. He attacked Rome and seized control of the government, assuming the title of dictator. Sulla enacted political reforms that were seen as conservative and anti-populist. He also awarded his supporters with land and confiscated the property of political enemies, which made him unpopular with the plebeians. Zola also brought the horror of the proscriptions to Rome. These were lists with the names of people that could be killed without any punishment. Their property was free to be seized. Many of Zola's enemies died. His followers became rich. Marcus Crassus, who was seen as the richest man of Rome, is the most striking example. This power struggle between Marius and Sulla revealed the deep political divisions that had engulfed Rome, which ultimately led to the fall of the Republic. Violence and disregard for political norms set a precedent for political assassination, which was used from now on again and again. The struggle also revealed the power of the Roman military, which had become a pawn in the hands of ambitious politicians. The reforms of Marius had allowed for the landless poor to serve as soldiers, which made them vulnerable to the political whims of their leaders. In conclusion, the conflict between Marius and Sulla was a manifestation of the increasing social and political tensions that ultimately led to the downfall of the Roman Republic. The struggle revealed the decay of political institutions, the increasing polarization of the political landscape, and the use of violence as a political tool. These issues paved the way for the rise of authoritarian rule and the collapse of the Republic. Almost at the same time, Rome was challenged on its home turf. The War of the Confederates erupted. It was also known as the Social War and it was a conflict that lasted from 91 until 88 BCE between the Roman Republic and several allied Italian states. The war was caused by a growing sense of dissatisfaction among the Italian allies, who believed that Rome was unfairly discriminating against them, which nailed it. The Italian allies had been seeking Roman citizenship for decades, but were consistently denied despite having provided Rome with substantial military support. The Italians had no political representation and this lack of power and influence fueled their growing resentment towards Rome. In 91 BCE, the situation finally came to a head when allies of Rome, the Marsi, led a rebellion against the Roman state. The rebellion spread quickly, with other Italian states joining in to form the Italian Confederation. They had their own senate, their capital was the city of Corfinium. The war itself was brutal and destructive, with both sides suffering heavy casualties and significant devastation to their territories. The tide of the war shifted in favor of the Republic due largely to the military prowess of several prominent Roman generals like Sulla, who were able to suppress the rebellion and reassert Roman control over the Italian states. But Following the conclusion of the war, Rome ultimately granted citizenship to the Italian allies, which helped to ease the tensions that had fueled the rebellion. However, the war had profound consequences for the Roman Republic and was one of the precursors to its eventual downfall. One of the key impacts of the war was its effect on the Roman army. The army had previously been comprised mainly of Roman citizens, 
But with the expansion of citizenship to the Allies, this began to change. The grueling war required a significant number of soldiers and Rome's decision to grant citizenship to the Italic people allowed for a wider recruitment pool, including those who were previously excluded from the army. This expansion of the army resulted once more in a shift in loyalty away from Rome and towards individual generals. This trend allowed for ambitious politicians like Caesar to cultivate a loyal and powerful military following, which led to the eventual demise of the Republic. Additionally, the War of the Confederates exposed the growing political tensions within the Roman state as different factions and groups fought for power and control. The conflict revealed the limitations of the Roman political and economical system and demonstrated that the Roman state was incapable of addressing the growing social and political inequality that had gripped the Republic. All in all, the War of the Confederates marked a significant turning point in Roman history. It highlighted the growing discontent among Rome's Italian allies and the limitations of the Roman political system, ultimately paving the way for what was to come. between Marcus Licinius Crassus and Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, commonly known as Crassus and Pompey, was a defining feature of Roman politics during the late stage of the Republic. 
both men were prominent military leaders and politicians who competed for power and influence in the turbulent political landscape of Rome. Their rivalry was shaped by personal ambition, strategic maneuvering and conflicting interests ultimately playing a pivotal role in the events that led to the downfall of the Republic. Let's highlight this at a few examples. Crassus came from a wealthy and influential family, but he sought to enhance his political standing through military glory and financial investments, particularly in real estate and slave ownership. Pompey, on the other hand, hailed from a less distinguished background, but amassed considerable wealth and prestige through his military successes and political alliances. Despite their military achievements, Crassus and Pompey faced stiff competition and mutual suspicion in Roman politics. Both men harbored ambitions for political supremacy and sought to outmaneuver each other to achieve their goals. Crassus and Pompey often found themselves on opposing sides of political debates and alliances, aligning with different factions within the Senate and courting support from influential patrons and allies. All in all, this means the rivalry between Crassus and Pompey set the stage for the political upheavals and civil wars that would ultimately lead to the collapse. Their competition for power and influence contributed to the formation of alliances and factions within the Roman elite, laying the groundwork for the most famous of them all, the first triumvirate and the subsequent rise of autocratic rule in Rome. The first triumvirate, meaning three men, was formed in 60 BCE and it was a political alliance between Julius Caesar, Pompey and Crassus. There were several reasons for the formation. One of the main reasons was the growing unrest in Rome, which was caused by political corruption in the Senate and the economic inequality resulting in the rise of populism among the plebeian class. The triumvirs, the three men, saw the political unrest as an opportunity to consolidate their power and they formed an alliance to further their political interests. Another reason for the formation of the triumvirate was the desire for influence and power within the Roman government. Pompey and Crassus were both successful generals, but they lacked Caesar's political instincts. For example, Pompey wasn't able to convince the Senate to pass his reorganization of the eastern provinces as law and to accept what he had promised his veterans. Even so, there was a huge fear within the Senate that Pompey wouldn't release his army after returning from the east, but turn it to Rome and end the Republic. Crassus felt neglected and complained his achievements weren't appreciated enough. Caesar hadn't had an important military command yet. By forming an alliance, the triumvirs were able to leverage each other's influence and resources to further their personal ambitions. Furthermore, Crassus was able to bankroll everything. The three men agreed not to do anything that would harm any one of them, and they wanted to support each other. They agreed to have Caesar elected as consul in 59 BCE. He would pass the laws Pompey wanted. Furthermore, all of them should get a special empire with an army. Pompey in Spain, Crassus in the east, and Caesar on the border to Gaul. The key role that the triumvirate played in the downfall of the Republic cannot be overstated. The triumvirate represented a shift in the balance of power from the Roman Senate to individual politicians who would leverage the resources and power of the Roman state to further their own interests. The triumvirs used their alliance to push through political reforms that weakened the power of the Roman Senate, paving the way for the autocratic rule that would come. That means we now need to talk in detail about the Roman, who might be the most famous of them all, Gaius Julius Caesar.
Caesar, Pompey and Crassus represented distinct factions within Roman society, yet their shared desire for power and prestige led them to forge a fragile alliance. This alliance was not destined to endure, as underlying tensions and conflicting interests ultimately drove a wedge between its members. There were several reasons for the end of the first triumvirate. First, there were ambitions and rivalries. As the triumvirs sought to expand their influence, their individual ambitions often clashed, leading to friction within the alliance. Julius Caesar in particular harbored aspirations of supreme authority and sought to consolidate power through military conquests and political maneuvering. Meanwhile, Pompey and Crassus harbored their own ambitions for military glory and wealth, respectively, which sometimes diverged from Caesar's objectives. The rivalry between Caesar and Pompey, once close allies, became increasingly pronounced as their spheres of influence overlapped and their egos clashed. God did their egos clash. Pompey, feeling overshadowed by Caesar's military successes in Gaul, began to resent his former allies' growing power and popularity, leading to a gradual deterioration of their relationship. The marriage between Caesar's daughter Julia and Pompey, which was very happy, was able to weaken the tensions for quite some time, but Julia died giving birth to the couple's first kid. The central connection between the two men was no more. Second, we need to talk about new alliances. The fragile balance of power within the Triumvirate was further destabilized by new alliances. In 53 BCE, Crassus met his demise in the disastrous Battle of Cae against the Parthian Empire, depriving the alliance of one of its key members. With Crassus out of the picture, the dynamic between Caesar and Pompey became increasingly strained. Pompey, feeling isolated and vulnerable, sought to align himself with the conservative faction in the Senate, hoping to bolster his position and counterbalance Caesar's growing influence. This move further widened the rift between him and Caesar, setting the stage for their eventual confrontation. Third, there was an erosion of trust and communication. Despite their initial friendship, the members of the first triumvirate gradually became suspicious of each other's motives and intentions. The lack of trust and effective communication excavated existing tensions, making cooperation increasingly difficult. Caesar's decision to cross the Rubicon River with his army in 49 BCE against the orders of the Senate and Pompey marked the ultimate breakdown of the triumvirate. This bold move sparked a civil war between Caesar and Pompey as the now de facto leader of the Republic. The Senate had viewed Caesar's rise with suspicion and alarm for quite some time before the war. Fearing the erosion of their privileges and the consolidation of power in the hands of a single individual, they sought to curb Caesar's influence through legal and political means. The tension between Caesar and the Senate reached a boiling point with the passage of a law in 49 BCE which ordered Caesar to disband his legions and return to Rome as a private citizen. Refusing to comply with the Senate's decree, knowing the Senate wanted him to stand trial and would convict him of several deeds, Caesar crossed the Rubicon River with his army, a move tantamount to a declaration of war against the Roman state. But Rubicon was a small river that separated Italy from the provinces. No general was allowed to bring his troops into Italy without being invited by the Senate to do so. Caesar tried a lot to prevent this from happening. Well, at least he said so. For example, he offered to be the proconsul of just one province with just one legion. It was refused. The Senate, led by figures such as the often mentioned Pompey and Cato the Younger rallied its forces in the defense of the Republic, thus precipitating a full-scale civil war between Caesar's supporters and the senatorial faction. Pompey was de facto dictator at this time. In 53 BCE, he already was consul without a colleague to stabilize the situation within the city. Violent gangs had taken control over several districts, and food was lacking. 
he was the central figure of politics, and he bragged that he would only have to stomp with his foot on the ground and there would be enough legions to defeat Caesar. This was wrong from the beginning. Caesar leading his army directly to Rome caught the senate of guard and had to flee. The decisive clash between Caesar and Pompey's forces took place at Pharsalus in Greece in 48 BCE. Despite being heavily outnumbered, Caesar's tactical brilliance and the loyalty of his veteran legions secured a resounding victory, effectively shattering the military power of the senatorial faction. Following his defeat at Pharsalus, Pompey fled to Egypt in search of refuge. However, his hopes for sanctuary were dashed when he was treacherously murdered by agents of the Egyptian king who sought to curry favor with the Caesar, which didn't work at all. Caesar is said to have been furious when Pompey's head was presented to him. With Pompey's demise, Caesar pursued his remaining adversaries across the Mediterranean, defeating pockets of resistance in Asia Minor, North Africa and Spain. The capture of key cities and the subjugations of Pompey's allies cemented Caesar's victory and consolidated his hold on power. Caesar's victory in the civil war paved the way for his ascent to unrivaled authority within the Roman state. In the aftermath of the conflict, he was appointed dictator for life, effectively sidelining the authority of the senate and assuming near absolute control over Rome. Caesar cultivated a cult of personality, portraying himself as a benevolent and charismatic leader capable of addressing the grievances of the Roman people. His populist rhetoric, lavish public spectacles and strategic patronage endeared him to the masses and bolstered his legitimacy in the eyes of the public. Caesar's dictatorship represented a significant departure from the decentralized governance structure of the Roman Republic. By concentrating authority in his own hands, Caesar effectively bypassed the traditional checks and balances of the Republican government, transforming Rome into a de facto autocracy. Despite this authoritarian rule, Caesar implemented a series of socio-political reforms aimed at addressing inequality, elevating poverty and stabilizing the Roman economy. These measures, including land redistribution and public work projects, garnered support from the urban poor and marginalized groups, further cementing Caesar's hold on power. But there was trouble brewing in the dark corners of Rome's patricians' palaces. Caesar's assassination, Rome descended into political turmoil with competing factions fighting for control. In response to the mounting instability, 
three prominent figures, Octavian, Mark Antony and Marcus Emilius Lepidus, formed the second triumvirate, a political alliance aimed at restoring order and consolidating power. They filled the power vacuum created by Caesar's death and their sought revenge at his murderers. Caesar's adopted heir Octavian emerged as a central figure in the post-Caesarian political landscape. Despite his youth and relative inexperience, Octavian leveraged his family name and political wit to rally support among Caesar's loyalists and assert his claim to leadership. This would bring him on collision course with Antony, who was one of the most loyal generals of Caesar. He saw himself as the true leader of the loyalists. But let's get not ahead of ourselves. In 43 BCE, Octavian, Antony and Lepidus entered into a formal alliance known as the Second Triumvirate, as I have mentioned, recognizing the need for collective action in the face of external threats and internal dissent. The Triumvirs agreed to share power and resources to main stability. The second triumvirate wasted no time in consolidating the authority, initiating a campaign of proscriptions and purges against their political enemies. Thousands of perceived adversaries were targeted for confiscation of property, exile or execution as the triumvirs sought to eliminate potential sources of opposition. Cicero was probably a victim of these proscriptions. Each member of the second triumvirate was assigned specific territories and responsibilities within the Roman Republic. Octavian assumed control over the western provinces, Antony over the east and Lepidus over Africa. This means the second triumvirate became now a formal alliance within what little still existed of the Republic. Despite their initial unity, tensions soon emerged among the triumvirs, fueled by the teased personal rivalries, conflicting ambitions and diverging loyalties. The relationship between Octavian and Antony in particular grew increasingly strained as they fought for supremacy within the alliance. Lepidus was willing to be a second in command behind Octavian. Antony and his new wife Cleopatra refused. A new civil war erupted. This had a personal di dimension as well. Antony had married Octavian's sister Octavia in 40 BCE which had helped to ease the tensions between the two men for quite some time. But that was the past. Octavian and Antony represented contrasting visions for the future of Rome. Octavian, seeking to restore stability and consolidate power under his own rule, emphasized traditional Roman values and institutions. Antony, on the other hand, aligned himself with the East and embraced a more autocratic style of governments aligning himself closely with Cleopatra and the Egyptian monarchy. The decisive clash between Octavian's forces and Antony's fleet occurred off the coast of Actium in Greece in 31 BCE. Octavian's general Marcus Agrippa's superior naval tactics and strategic maneuvering resulted in a resounding victory effectively shattering Antony's hopes for victory and forcing him to flee. Following his defeat at Actium, Antony's forces were besieged by Octavian's legions in Alexandria, which was Egypt's capital. Facing dwindling supplies and internal dissent, Antony and Cleopatra ultimately chose to take their own lives rather than face capture or humiliation at the hands of Octavian. Octavian's victory solidified his position as the undisputed leader of Rome. With his rivals vanquished, Octavian turned his attention to consolidating his power and reshaping the political landscape. In 27 BCE, Octavian publicly renounced dictatorial powers and returned authority to the Roman Senate, ostensibly restoring the Republic. However, in reality, this marked the beginning of the Principate, a new form of government in which power was concentrated in the hands of the Emperor while maintaining the facade of republican institutions. Principate means the first. Octavian presented himself as the first citizen of Rome. He was the leader, but accepted publicly to still be a citizen, which nevertheless led to the creation of the Roman Empire. As Augustus, an honorary title meaning the supreme, 
Octavian embarked on a series of reforms aimed at stabilizing the Roman state and promoting social cohesion. These included administrative reforms, military reorganization and infrastructure projects designed to bolster the economy and ensure the loyalty of the populace. Augustus also cultivated a carefully crafted image as the savior of Rome. He promoted a cult of personality centered around himself, portraying himself as divinely ordained and the embodiment of Roman virtues such as piety, clemency and wisdom. The transformation of Octavian into Augustus represents the great watershed moment in Roman history, marking the consolidation of power and the transition from republic to empire. Through astute political maneuvering, strategic alliances and careful manipulation of public perception, Augustus established himself as the first Roman emperor and laid the foundation for centuries of imperial rule. Many of the institutions, traditions, customs and laws of the Republic still existed, but they were a mere shadow of their former glory.